Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Exorcise Your Rights. And we have an amazing treat today, something I know all of you have been waiting for, and that is the Unquiet Sisterhood here, the, the editors and authors behind Unquiet Spirits, which I know you'll really, really love that book. So welcome, everybody. I'm going to let you start because you're the co-editor of this. Everybody introduce yourselves and let's go from there. Oh, thank you, Angela, for having us. Um, my name is Lee Murray, and I am a writer, editor, poet, essayist, and screenwriter from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, I have five Bram Stokers and uh, Shirley Jackson um, that I share with Genevieve over here, and I'm super excited to be here with my sisters once again um, to talk about Unquiet Spirits. Kaomi? I'm um, just going <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, my name is Kiyomi Appleton Gaines. I am a, a writer of uh, short stories, um, sci fi, fantasy, and horror, and a contributor to Unquiet Spirits. And I'm really thrilled to be here today. That's awesome. Jean? Hi, I'm Genevieve Flynn. I'm uh, an author, editor, and poet, thanks to Angela and Lee, and um, I'm co-editor with Lee for Black Crane's um, Tales of Unquiet Women. Did I get that right? I feel like I got, I'm getting so mixed up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> with all the different, different iterations. Oh, yeah, 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 Tales of Unquiet okay. Women. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, is yeah. the, the anthology that's probably started um, this whole movement in system and also contributed to Tortured Willows. Um, and uh, very excited to be here as well. And I, I, I've only got two stokers. <laughs> I, I only have two as well, so. You know. <laughs> I do have a Shirley Jackson and Ori Alice Award, which I'm very excited about. That's so awesome. Yvette? So I am Yvette Fan. I am a Manila-based uh, horror writer and journalist, and I'm a contributor to Unquiet Spirits. Excellent. And world-renowned in her country, what's more, <laughs> so we're very pleased to have her. So, so privileged to have her. Angela, who are you? Oh, yes. Uh, I am a... <laughs> I am your host, but so I'm normally here, but I also happen to be a co-editor of Unquiet Spirits. And uh, yeah, I only have two stokers. I have no Shirley Jackson. I have no of the other stuff that these these guys mentioned. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, but that, and that's pretty much it. And we published, Eureka Publishing was behind Tortured Willows, where Raw Dog was behind, no, Omnium Gatherum, and then Raw Dog was behind Black Cranes and Unquiet Spirits is by as behind. Well, my words are getting tangled up. Black Spot Books is who published Unquiet Spirits. Wow, so many. There's so many moving parts in this trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> so, but let's first let's go into everybody's essays because we all have essays, um, including the co-editors for this. Um, that's what I want to do first: is talk about our essays. What was the inspiration behind it, and what does it mean to you? Like. Lee. <laughs> oh, I'm going to start with me. That's mean. That's mean. Um, you know, obviously, we wanted to um, to go forward and 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 seed more um, unquiet spirit stories into the world after Black Cranes and Tortured Willows, and essays were a fantastic opportunity to approach it in a different manner um, and and broaden the group as well because we were learning about so many wonderful writers and it was an opportunity to include even more um, of our wonderful sisterhood and so we went to essays and my essay and look struggle with hubris because we didn't want to we we did we weren't going to actually put ourselves in in this collection were we Angela but then no. um, our publisher said no you should probably be in here and and then we put ourselves first and last. So we really struggled with that because we needed a way to kind of frame um, the, the essays and, and, and introduce them and, and close the discussion. So my, um, 
my my essay is called Displaced. Um, I think it's called Displaced Spirits. I think, um, and it, it it really looks at the sort of hungry ghost um, um, mythology. And really, I thought that was a wonderful metaphor for um, the Asian diaspora in general, because because. Um, we all are living in different places um, and have our, and well, in westernized, in some ways, westernized cultures. Um, Eva, it's looking at particularly um, the very Catholic culture of other Philippines as well. And so, you know, there's these, the way that we're trying to fit our culture into the new places that we live or the new types of, the new types of, um, societies that we live in and so just uh, the hungry ghost was really a really great way to look at that so my my looks at that particular aspect and how when you're displaced and, and certainly in Chinese culture um, your your ghost needs to go back to that original soil if you like um, where where um, your family first originated and if you are in a different country it can't do that so effectively you become a hungry your your spirit will become a hungry ghost and for women it's always the case because we are connected to first our father's family and then our husband's family and then our sons um, and so we have you know we have no no place to go so that was really something that i was investigating and in particular around the ventnor um uh, shipwrecking. I know this sounds very odd, but in New Zealand, most of the um, Chinese first came as as miners, and they there was a poll tax. We couldn't get women out here, so for a long time it was just men, and um, they wanted to get these bodies back. And a lot of people died here. They didn't have the money to get back, and so they wanted to ship the remains back, so that those souls would not become hungry ghosts and they could be buried in the soil of their families back home in China. But the the ship wrecked and um, and those souls were lost to the sea and the the trauma that that caused in New Zealand Chinese society. And then um, in this in the in the so this is my essay. It's a bit of a mess essay in that it uses poetry and and prose and um, and also um, um, non-fiction resources to 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 um, discuss the thesis, but then my daughter came along and wrote an essay afterwards because um, the land that the just off the coast where the shipwreck occurred, the land is owned by uh, the e, a particular iwi, and that is my husband's iwi, where uh, which is the tribe. So my daughter is um, that particular tribe nurtured the bones and the remains of those that were washed up on the shore and so it came sort of full circle because my daughter was trying to find her identity and so she explored further that idea through this fox spirit mythology um, so yeah so it's kind of a roundabout way of getting to um, how I introduced the idea of displacement and diaspora which is really the essence of this um, this this anthology as seen through the lens of, of Asian mythology. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. I'm glad it, it was actually really good that I, I called on you because I planned this, that you would actually talk about why we did this as well. So thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Could you start out like that would be a good thing to talk about first. Um, but, but, who, but who wants to go next? Who wants to go next and, and talk about your essay or what inspired it? I'll jump in. I hope Sadie having a point. <laughs> um, when, when Lee and Angela, you, you guys invited me to write um, for this collection, the the first thing I wanted to explore was the um, the generational trauma that's in my family, and I kind of played off the one of my stories from Black Cranes. Um, Little Worm, which uh, is about the Gui Giao, which is a vampiric ghost baby. And it's something that's um, passed on through generations. It's very difficult to get rid of. Um, and there, there's the, this trauma that happened in my family. It was, was the, the death of my mother's older sister that, was, um, that, that created quite seismic shocks through her family and then influenced, I think, a lot of behaviors and a lot of thinking afterwards. 
but I, I'd gotten sort of fragments of the story, but not the whole story. And I wanted to, for, for myself as well, to understand um, what happened and how it's shaped our family all, the, all these years and how it's come to shape me and maybe, well, most likely shaped my, my children as well. Uh, so that that's my what I did with my essay, um, which is, has got the probably the longest title in the whole <laughs> So it, it's uh, some things are dangerous but can be lived with, which is the final line from my story from Little Worm, um, and it's that the you know, the ghost baby of Malaysian myth, and looking at how we can use ghosts and hauntings to think about. Um, intergenerational trauma and how how our lives are shaped and the, the, this um this thing that that kind of latches onto your family and that that through through your own behaviors you, you kind of feed it but it feeds off you as well and how how it gets um it might have started off innocently with a, a trauma that but then it becomes something much more sinister and hungry because it's it's being fed by your responses to, to this grief and to this trauma so and and this and i think it's it's happened for a lot of us writing um it opened up a conversation with my mother and helped us to talk about some things that um i think lee you've said this before with with asian families we don't really talk about um certain things where we we try to gloss over or we we don't touch on the those sore points but this was a, a way to really talk about it in uh more of an academic way so there's a bit of distance but it, it's also quite healing because we're we're, we're finally talking about th this huge event so that that was my my essay which probably gave me as much as i'm hoping it gives to readers Excellent. Excellent. And so many good points there too. I mean, just, yeah, th this has been cathartic, I think for all of us. Oh, it's so. such a moving essay too, isn't it? And I think we should have given your mother a byline on this essay, Genevieve, because I, so. I think she had a lot of input into it, but it's hugely powerful. We're so, yeah. we're so grateful to have it in the collection. And um, for, for her, it was, it was incredibly powerful to have, this chance to talk about it and she she was so excited when well, it was almost like we were co-writing it because I, I would send off my my draft to, to Lee and Andrew and say all right I'm done and my mom would say I've, I've had another idea I've, I've remembered something else and that that was lovely but I had to say oh, mom I'm sorry I've sent it I can't keep doing that to Lee and Angela <laughs> but see there's your next co-author like now you and your mother have to do a book yeah. <laughs> and that, how about your essay? Can you tell us about Fallen Leaves, New Soil? Okay. I, and what I inspired feel, it? I feel like my essay is the least personal in the collection. And um, that's because I, I tend to keep away from my Chinese roots. So I'm Chinese Filipino. Uh, our family emigrated here. My grandparents emigrated here. They got married here. My parents were born here, but I still feel very disconnected from my. I feel very disconnected from my Chinese side because uh, we were raised Christian. We went to Western schools. Um, my essay examined how I came to be a horror writer because it's it's not done in both Chinese and Filipino cultures. Um, Chinese both of the both because. Um, both cultures are very wary of the supernatural and they try not to attract any attention from it. And from the Chinese side, because, you know, being a writer doesn't make money. <laughs> really. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> um, except unless you're Stephen King. It's, it's, it's very, you know. So um, my essay starts from how I got into the supernatural, which has always been an interest. And that's through books and through TV. And in the 80s, it was because there was a very thin line between actual news and um, things like woman gives birth to the fish on TV. And that got me interested. So it was an examination of that. And also 
an examination of why, which this would later lead to further examinations on why, um, like in other cultures, you come in the, when you, when you emigrate, you bring your supernatural features with you. So, um, but I noticed that for the Chinese, you don't, you, you, you have your traditions, you have your culture, but um, no actual supernatural spirits. So it would lead to that in the future. But I also used a lot of personal um, family lore um, with the supernatural. Like, for example, my grandmother, when she was a child in China, she saw a vision of angels moving up and down heaven in what looked like an escalator. But there were no escalators at that time because she was born in 1911, I think. So she didn't know what was going on and they were speaking a strange language. And then cut to, she moves to the Philippines, has a family, has uh, children in Catholic schools. And then one day she notices my uncle read, um, like doing his lessons in a, in a different language. She's like, what language is that? That's what I heard in China. And it turns out he was studying Latin. So there was a weird um, round, thing um circular thing going on sorry it's 6 a.m here <laughs> <laughs> so i have coffee in front of me so please bear with me so yeah um my my essay even though it was i feel not as personal as the others i feel in a weird way um it makes sense because i'm not there yet as a writer i'm not in touch fully in touch with my uh, my roots and that impersonality is my way of moving towards understanding what I'm doing here, um, how I became a horror writer, why I love the supernatural so much, why I'm I I want to research in that subject so much. Yeah, so, I um, think that's that's the strength of this collection, though, is there are so many various approaches, like from super personal to like more distant. So it has kind of appealed to everybody, right, Lee? Yeah, but I, you know, I, I love the way Yvette says it's not very personal. And then she tells us all the ways that it is personal <laughs> to her. And um, and I think, no, and I think I used the word meandering when I first, when we first discussed your essay, Yvette, because it, you could see Yvette working towards this identity, and it's very clear in the in the essay that that she's really struggling with, you know, the the juxtaposition of the way she's lived her life, but also all the all the law that that has underpinned it, and the things she's chosen to follow, um, like mm. the the strange fish, and on you know the story about the woman giving birth to a fish. Those those kind of the weirdness that. That Eva has tried, has followed up in a sense of finding her own space in this in this mishmash of of cultures and and um, society and and values and all of those kinds of things. So, and it is such a fresh. It's a different approach. It's quite fresh and quite tentative, if you like, but um, but still very powerful. So I I don't think you can discount it as being in a a not personal account because it's very personal in the way that you have approached it. So um, I guess I guess it's different from the others. That is for sure. It's not the same as some of the others, but it, it has its own power. And so definitely don't discount it. It, it definitely has its own power. Yeah, I Thank just, you. I feel a little bit bad, Yvette, because you said it's like not a Chinese thing to write horror or Filipino. It's also not a woman thing. So no, <laughs> you, yes. know, yes. you, you picked no, the worst yes. niches. <laughs> <laughs> we love you here. Yes. We are also in those niches. We love you here. <laughs> okay. uh, Kiyomi, right? I, I'm saying it wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So I suppose um, to just to add on to, to your to your point, though, Angela, is that I would I would say that horror is almost essentially a. a, a female genre though I mean it's so rooted in like feminine narratives and experience yeah. and identity so much of the time you know those stories are I don't know they, they tend to often be women's stories or stories about women's experience um so I think 
I think that even though maybe we don't have as large a presence or voice, a lot of the stories themselves are about are. about um, female identity and, and feminine experience. Um, yeah, so my, my essay, um, I was at a point in my life where I was sort of coming to the final conclusion that I would not be a mother and, um, and thinking about the ways that we define womanhood and how we define and identify the monstrous. Um, because uh, one, of, one of the things that has kind of loomed large for me is there's always, I think, and, and probably for a lot of us, there's there's sort of a, a pressure as people who are female identified that um, you should be a mother, or if you're not a mother, you should want to be a mother. And um, and there's not a whole lot of space outside of that sort of trajectory. Um, even a few weeks ago, I was reading an article. It was titled something like. Um, stop calling women superheroes or stop telling women they're awesome, something like that, um, to do with how as women, we we tend to have a lot of social and cultural expectations and pressures around the things that we're supposed to do and the things that, um, that we're expected to accomplish. And when, as I was reading the article though, she was talking entirely about mothers and motherhood. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't women broadly, it was mothers specifically, um, but her title spoke to womanhood. And so, so often we see this sort of overlap and this sort of blending of these two words, woman and mother, as though they mean the same thing and they don't. Um, and so my essay, I was coming to that sort of experience and that, um, realization reckoning with that that i would not be a mother and as an asian woman and 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 within our our you know cultures as as varied as they are family is so important um and our lineage and and who our descendants are and um you know lee you spoke to it and, and um japanese culture has sort of a similar idea that if you don't have your descendants take care of your grave and of your memory appropriately, you become an Oni. And so, um, so I, I was, I was not speaking specifically to the decision not to be a mother, but more to the experience of what that does, um, what that does at an individual level from, from those, those societal and cultural pressures and, and what it means when we say someone is not a woman if they are not also a mother. And um, and trying to find ways to reconcile that within my culture. And so um, and I found sort of a, a touch point in that in Yamauba in the Mountain Witch of Japan and the history of her narrative and how it was influenced both um, the earlier Shinto tradition, and then how it was shaped later with the coming of, of Buddhism to Japan. Um, so that that was kind of the impetus for what I wrote. Excellent, excellent. I like that you bring up too that <clears throat> woman is not exclusive to motherhood, but also right. that kind of says to motherhood, that's all we are. Like that is our worth. Is you know, so I, I'm I'm really yeah. happy that you address that. You know, yeah. Totally. It was such a unique perspective and so beautifully written as well. And I love the 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 particular poems that you pulled into your your essay, Kiyomi, which were just gorgeous. And and that sense of lonely loneliness that 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 must arise when you're you're excluded in that way. Um, and particularly by Asian cultures, because you are not anyone. If you you, you I mean, I think if you if you consider um, just the the characters in for in Chinese, for example, for mother, you know, for good is is a mother with a son. You know, you're not good unless you unless you are a mother with a son. So, such a, a vital um, you know a relationship to it to um, 
to investigate, but also that non relationship, you know, that non relationship is also important. And it does it doesn't make you any less worthy of the title of woman. And I just think it was just such an important perspective to have. Well, we really we were really thrilled when we got this essay, weren't we, Angela? Because it was it was oh, we quite I mean, it wasn't the only essay that looked at not at choosing not to but it just it just took this very fresh perspective so um we were really pleased to have it and again very yeah. monstrous and i think and, and i i've often said this um but and uh um christina singh wrote a little haiku a little poem at the very beginning of um her section in in tortured willows and it goes like this and i'm going to actually read it because i always get it i always mutilate it but it says daughter why are all avenging ghosts so why are avenging ghosts or women mother because we have just cause Ooh. and and you know i just think that's wonderful because in some ways kiyomi's essay embodies that because you know you can't even be a woman without a child you know that, that you may not be and that's just that's just effacing this whole group of of women, you know, just um, facing them from 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 existence, and so you can understand that avenging ghost idea um, so clearly. Yeah, yeah. I actually thought of that uh, haiku from Christina when you were talking about the um, <clears throat> the the these are women stories. Maybe mm -hmm. we haven't historically been allowed to tell them or get the credit for them, but they are primarily women's stories. Horror is so. Yeah. So actually, which brings me to my next question. Um, my essay talks about the Nikeku V, the headless vampire ghost. What is it about Asian ghosts and monsters that are so scary? Because you've got the the traditional European, you know, the vampire and the werewolf and the ghost. I kind of feel like that's it, right? Isn't there like three? <laughs> I think there's more. I don't want to like... But uh, in Asian culture, besides just Asian culture just being such a wide expanse of what does that even mean we have i think the most interesting ghosts and monsters so why do you guys think that is i th i think i'll go back to what i was saying earlier asian ghosts and monsters are so often tied to like narratives of, of feminine ideals that are either mm -hmm. transgressed in some way or they're adhered to but then that obedience sort of leads to some kind of betrayal from society whether that's the family or the lover or the culture in some way. And I think that is found in a lot of monster narratives that that sort of feminine structure or, or experience. But Asian stories are less sanitized, if that's the right word. So I think they retain a stronger sense of like that anger and vengeance and having that juxtaposed with stereotypes of subservient Asian femininity and the more subtle forms of body horror that you find in Asian lore, um, I think works to sort of create a deeper sense of that unsettling or that discomfort when you when you hear these stories. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, to add to what Kiyomi said, I feel that um, Asian monsters are scarier because they operate by different rules from Western monsters. And mm -hmm. what everyone is used to is Western monsters. Um, like Asian monsters tend to be more, well, more emotion fueled, as Kiyomi mentioned, also more chaotic. So you don't know what's going on. There, there are no, uh, you have no rule book. Even when they operate by certain rules, you're sh you're still not sure what's going on. So. Yeah, I think with, with um, a lot of our hauntings and ghosts and creatures, we a lot of Asian cultures just accept that they're part of the universe, and that there there may only be a very thin veil between the the supernatural and and our natural world, but it. Uh, a lot of, you know, with my family, we, we just accepted that there, there were just certain things you did um, to appease them and to, to keep them happy and certain things you avoided to avoid drawing their attention. But it's just there. It is just part of the world. There, there isn't that um, sense of, I think, with, with some Western mythology where it, it's that question, does it exist? 
and for, for particularly for Chinese and Malaysian mythologies, yes, it does. And you just have to, to uh, follow some of the, these traditions to try to keep safe. But again, as Yvette said, sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes they're, they're, they are just furious and chaotic. And it, it's almost like a force of, it, it is, to, to us it's a force of nature. It's just another force of nature. And I think that's what, what makes it frightening. I think uh, in Western, and um, sorry, Lee, I didn't mean to interrupt No, go you. ahead, go ahead, no. I was just going to say, I think in, in Western um, monster and ghost lore, there's usually some sense of something that has gone wrong that can be fixed, that can make the monster go away. And in Asian stories, that's less the case. It's not, you know, to, to Jane's point, it's not a thing that, can be made to go away or, or be fixed. It's, it's just a part of our, our nature and part of our reality. Yeah, well, I, I think um, it's relevant that uh, that Angela's put these googly eyes on the background because, you know, those are from everything, everywhere, all at once. And I, I've said this before, but when I first saw this, um, that movie, I watched it with my 80-year-old mother and my, um, my queer daughter and her partner. And um, yes, I think. Uh, wife and um, and then and then <laughs> and and the reason my, my mother said uh, she said oh there's a lot happening all at once here you know there's a lot happening isn't there and you know really for Asian women there has only been one path there is you have a child you have a child you have a boy preferably and you raise your family and you subsume all of your desires and wants and needs to raising that family and that is your role. That is it. That is it, you know, to do the taxes and do the laundry and make the noodles the way dad likes it and do the things that support the family. Um, and so the only place that that women can be their true selves um, and 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 is 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 when they die you know basically and they're so hungry and desperate to be their own selves that they're voracious and angry and full of fury and that is why asian ghosts are so damn scary because there is only one way for asian women and we have all stepped off that path first of all we're writing horror we're being loud and talking about things we're meant to be quiet about you know, and we want more than just the roles that have been assigned to us. Um, how dare we? How dare we? And therefore, that's where those monsters come, those Asian monsters come from, I think. Yeah, I agree with you, especially because we're bringing up that they tend to be women's stories and they tend to be chaotic and angry. And that's us, like the, the you know, speak when you're spoken to and you behave a certain way and a mother gives all things and a woman gives all things like you can't have the last slice of cake for God's sakes, even though you baked it and it's your plate and you, you know, you bought the damned ingredients and everything else. And so then, you know, that, that was my, my thing with the Nikekubi is that we actually can rip ourselves apart. You know, maybe that's what the Nikekubi is. We're so good in the daylight that at night when we loosen that control, we're literally tearing ourselves apart and we're angry so that's very good points. I think I feel like we're all saying the same thing. Because we're pissed. That's why it's so scary. And you should be afraid. You should yeah, be afraid. very afraid because we're unquiet and pissed. <laughs> Which actually I want to bring up like why all of this started, why this started with uh black frames with uh Lee and Jean, like from the very beginning. And that was because COVID had happened um, and there was all the happy violence, all the Asian hate because of the whole rhetoric of where COVID came from and, and just people looking for scapegoat. Um, and that is what spawned black cranes. And I, I, for me personally, that's why I was so, I, I can tell you this now, I'd have given you my story for free, <clears throat> but now I'll say that now. Damn, but it was just damn. <laughs> Oh, too late now. I've already spent it. <laughs> but it was because it was more than just the story. It was, you know, the, the rage that I, I have no voice in this. And that we have gotten that story back so many times through Black Cranes, through Tortured Willows, through Unquiet Spirits. This, this is our opportunity to say something against what's happening. You know, that this is not fair. Not even being a woman, 
but now also just being Asian, you know, Asian and a woman and a horror writer and all the other things. We're just like a terrible group here. I just, I'm realizing how terrible we are. So we're in good company. But how, how do you guys feel with that? Do you feel like your stories or your essays and your involvement in all of these projects was also fueled by that, that kind of pushback of the Asian hate and all that stuff that was going on and still is, I'd, li I'd like to say was going on, but is going on. Uh, in, it's sad to say that in Australia that there is still very much that fear of the, the yellow peril. It, it comes and goes, um, but the really disheartening thing is um, often it seems to have been it, it comes and goes because of politicians raising it and legitimizing that those stereotypes and those fears. Um, I came to Australia only probably maybe 10 or 15 years after um, the white Australia policy was abolished. So there, there was a lot of anti-Asian um, feeling and I was often the, the only Asian kid in, in a, a white school and the other Asian kid was my brother. So the, the two of us stuck out like you know, sore thumbs and it felt, um, it felt good to be writing these stories but also uh, unsafe in some ways because I, I'd spent so many um, years, um, you know, so many my childhood and teenage years almost erasing as much of my Asian identity as I could because you don't want to stand out. You don't want to draw any attention because uh, so many times I've walked past a group of people and you don't know if you're going to be catcalled or if you're going to be told to go back to your own country. Um, so, so here I was writing these stories and essays and poems, pointing a big arrow at myself saying, hey, I'm Asian, I'm a woman, and these are the things that, um, I'm angry about and that, that felt again good but also unsafe in some way but I think that's probably the best reason to be writing these things is to say this is my experience and this is you know what it's like and maybe if there is another um, Chinese girl somewhere and she feels like she's got to erase herself she's got to be quiet she's got to be invisible um, to, to read something that says, you know, I see what it's like, I know, um, maybe that's the, the best reason to be writing it. I agree. Yeah, who wants yeah. to go next? Well, I kind of think it's a little bit about representation, you know, like just that connection that we that we had, Genevieve, genre con, and just, yay! Someone else who gets this, you know, some of these things. And and even though we've had some similar experiences, we had quite different experiences. So, you know, I also was the only, you know, Chinese kid in school apart from my brother and my cousin, you know, and um, so I totally understand that. And that, you know, go back where you came from and I'm born here, so how do I do that? All of those sorts of things applied to me too. Um, we're right in the middle of an election right now. And, you know, a couple of the, one of the political parties is talking about abolishing the Bill of Rights, you know, because we're all equal. You know, like it's not true. You know, that isn't, we aren't there yet. And, you know, when we're there, yes, then we can think about it. But, um, so I think, um, to me, I think that the, one of the things that was wonderful was, first of all, the connection with these wonderful women who, who got me, who, yes, I belong here because we also feel these things, but also the differences, the, the differences in our experiences and our hopes. And um, so I wanted that exploration as well. We are not a homogenous group. We are so diverse, even within this group of Asian women horror writers who are who have something to say, you know. And I, and I am, you know, let's let's be ex inclusive um, while other groups are trying to exclude us from the dialogue. And I think that that mm. has been one of the most powerful things: the dialogue between mothers and sisters and daughters, but other women, but also just the the community that it's created for us has been 
you know, that I belong here, even if I don't belong somewhere else. That I belong. These women will accept me for who I am and what I represent. And so, um, that's that's been hugely powerful because when you're told to be quiet, and yet this group is letting me be unquiet, that that's just that's just I don't know. It's just un it's unfathomable the power and the empowerment that comes from that. So I'm super grateful. That's all I can say. That's awesome. And we've, Demanding. We've also, <laughs> but we've also had um, a, a wonderful response from people that aren't Asian women writers. Mm -hmm. Where we've had so many supporters. Um, Alex um, Hoffley. I can't say his name. Hoffley. Is that right? Uh, yes, Hoffelich, I think, is correct from Singapore um, and the Skate Parties. Yeah, yeah, um, and they've they championed Black Cranes as, when they came across their desk. They, they said we we love this, what it's saying, and they you know um, featured a couple of the stories from the collection as well. So we've had people that are are saying. Um, we want to read these stories. We want to find out more, and we'll we'll you know champion you guys, which which has been wonderful. So that that it's, I think this sisterhood is is more than just a sisterhood as well. It's it's almost a community that's come up around what we're writing at the moment, um, and I, I think that there is more diversity coming into publishing in the stories that we're we're hearing and we're telling and that are getting published which is i don't know whether or not black cranes was a part of it it feels like that that breaking through was a, a part of it but it's it's happening you know, for for a lot of different communities as well and that's that's really exciting to to even be a, a small part of that i agree i agree <clears throat> how about you too Either one, don't get, see that is, <clears throat> I'm gonna just say like, you know, there's the Asian tropes. These will always be the most polite panels. <laughs> like other panels, you're like, okay, okay, can you let other people talk now? <laughs> so you have to like, <laughs> but for us, it, it literally is, okay. Waiting one, two, three, that's a polite amount of distance. My opinion is. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go last because I don't live in a Western country. Okay. 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 Um, so I'll say um, in the U.S. at least, and I, I think in and other other Western countries as well. There's a lot of assumptions about what it means to be Asian, what it means to be a minority, what it means to be a woman, um, and during COVID, there were a lot of ways that Asian culture and Asian bodies were coming under attack, bearing the brunt of sort of that Western anxiety, um, expected to be like scapegoat and balm. And, um, you know, which unfo unfolded in this like very long historical context of exactly those things. Um, here last year, uh, Roe was overturned. This year, affirmative action was overturned. Um, and I think our current political climate kind of heightens that awareness of what, what makes us different and what makes us vulnerable. Um, and through the process of, of this book and, and becoming a part of this community, we were sharing these very deeply intimate stories and moments in a lot of ways from our own lives in a space that between us was safe, but in the wider world and in a wider context doesn't always necessarily okay. feel so. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, and I think even though I mean, we've had such a wonderful reception and I think that but I, but I think that there is still a sense of that um, uncertainty or, or even unsafety. Um, but I think that that's part of what is fueling sort of the the reaction to this book and these these stories is is that that other people are are also feeling that vulnerability, feeling that sense of of uncertainty, and finding a place here within our stories within us sharing our truth where where there, there's also safety for them mm -hmm. yeah. oh, 
Yeah. So um, in the Philippines, it wasn't as bad as in Western countries, but when the pandemic began, there was still a sense of um, wariness around um, Oriental looking people, like because uh, especially the Chinese, to the point where I enter a store, for example, and then you can you can feel people holding their breath to see, okay, is she from China? And then I'd speak Tagalog, and you can hear everyone go, she's one of us, which I feel is a big, I mean, it sounds awful, but I also feel that it's a big improvement from before where um, people would just look at you and like my parents' time, where they'd see your, your mm -hmm. eyes and then go, oh, okay, Chinese, you're not one of us. But now um, the Chinese, the Filip Chinese Filipinos have more or less integrated into society so that we are considered Filipino for the most part um, versus the Chinese who a lot of people aren't so happy about because they're kind of stealing our islands. <laughs> um, yeah, but to be part of this community was great because you, I had a chance to interact with um, other people who were more or less going through the same thing in different parts of the world. So there was a sense of security and also a sense of belongingness because we all wrote horror. We're all strange. <laughs> <laughs> we are, we're all not the typical Chinese, uh, like Asian woman who's very meek and very just says yes to everything. Yeah. And it's pro patriarchy. So it, it was, uh, it's really nice to find other people and to be part of a community where you're, you're all the same. You spend um, a, a lot of, like me, um, I spent most of my life being different and to suddenly be, to realize that, okay, I am not so different. There are other people like me. That was very nice. That's awesome. And I think that's one of the beautiful things, at least to me, is the community that we've built from this that Jean and Lee started. And it just, it keep, we keep saying, oh, we're done now. We said we had our peace. But actually, and, and, and for me, it was like back in Black Cranes when all that stuff was going on. I remember telling Ryan, my husband, um, if I just take my middle name out, probably nobody would know that I'm part Asian. But then there's that choice. My grandmother didn't want to use her middle name for the same reason. She didn't want people to. Uh, that was actually her first name. I'm sorry. And then I was named after her for the same reason. So that was kind of my, my turning point of going, do I want to continue that, though? And I really, I remember thinking, you know, and saying, probably being a little bit dramatic, but maybe not because there's been so many problems that I might get drug out in the street and like killed or beat up or something because I have this middle name. And then it's just thinking like how many people that is like a very, like, I feel like I was being dramatic at the time, but we're in Brazil now because of the Roe versus Wade and a lot of other problems. So in the U.S. So, you know, are we being dramatic? And I think these these books and this community that we've formed is is the best way to fight that because we're not alone. Um, and since we represent five countries here, I mean, I'm sorry, Brazil, you got me. <laughs> I'm like partially representing Brazil. Um, do you want to say something about like the climate that you're in from your perspective, from your point of view in your country about like the way it is right now? Do you, what changes do you see for the positive? Because I'd like to end this on a hopeful note. It's election day here, so <laughs> maybe I just have to wait till a bit later in the day. Um, <laughs> um, I think I think as storytellers, um, we there's always hope because when you take when you write stories, you're looking at new perspectives and new ways of looking at things through metaphor, through allegory. Through, through some kind of storytelling approach, even if it's a poem or, a, or an essay. Um, and you, you look at, you take a new way of looking at things and that offers hope, that offers a possibility because stories are transformational and they, they inform, um, they, they educate, engage, entertain, and they're a different, they're a, a safe way of looking at things. So I think it's for me, um, this, having this group and 
this group offers a perspective that hasn't been given before. So that black cranes, tortured willows, unquiet spirits, where were those stories before now? And so now we have a, a, a powerful um, voice for Asian women in horror telling these kinds of stories. And that's a new way of looking at things that we didn't have in this world before us. So I, I'm really proud of it. And I'm hoping that we are part of the movement for a different way of looking at things um, and perhaps offering some solution and some safety. So, um, and that, that, then I include New Zealand in that because, you know, um, I think the first New Zealand anthology of Asian voices only came out in 2020 as well. It's called A Clear Dawn. Um, and wow, it's pretty powerful, right? To have a first anthology ever of Asian voices in New Zealand, not specifically horror, um, but it was about time, right? You know, it's about time, um, several hundred, you know, a hundred odd years, more than a hundred years on from the first New Zealander, uh, the first New Zealand woman stepping foot um, in, uh, you know, a Chinese woman setting foot, setting foot on in New Zealand soil. And the, by the way, the report of that in the newspaper was that uh, they called the first Chinese woman um, to, to, to land here an almond-eyed difficulty. <laughs> So that's just you know. So hopefully we're making some making some changes. Yeah, I we're living like, up to that. <laughs> I kind of like that to claim that title though. Yes, yeah. I am a difficulty. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, I've yeah, I've popped it in um, a fox spirit on a distant cloud, as you as you know, um, Genevieve. So because it was just just such a powerful statement, you know, that's that's the way they viewed. Um, Chinese women from the beginning, yeah. And I, I feel like that is an anthology title. I'm just saying. I, oh I, my I, goodness! This is how these things start. Just one more time, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> so we keep going. Okay, and we're done. Except. <laughs> Look, I just I think there are plenty of more in this group to to pick up the mantle and and I'm seeing it happen amongst um, our unquiet spirits contributors mm. and beyond we are seeing so many wonderful books and stories and um, poetry collections coming through so it, it's it's not up to us entirely there there are more of us and you know I just let's just you know I can't wait to embrace all that new work coming forward and those new oh, ideas. Yeah. Can you, I mean, just, and then I want to go back to that question, but can you imagine like when all this started with black cranes at that time and COVID and all that, that time frame that you would ever say, oh yeah, there's going to be a Korean subtitled movie, Squid Games on Netflix that everybody is insane about. There's going to be the Koju Suzuki, wasn't he the... Yes, the Lifetime Achievement Award Thank winner. Yeah, I was the like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the first Asian yes. Lifetime Achievement. Um, and then we had like Parasite. I mean, there was like just stuff. And then everything, everywhere, all at once took everything, everywhere, all at once. So it's just kind of like, <laughs> just could not have imagined this. If somebody had told me all of this, you know, and then these three books would have the reception that they have. I would have been like, you are so deluded. <laughs> Here we all are. <laughs> I've, been, I've been deluded most of my life. So, you know, a little bit longer is just fine. It's just fine. <laughs> <laughs> but like Lisa, I think it's, it's the, there are other people um, pushing the, this movement forward. Like recently for the Brisbane Writers' Festival, um, that they worked with the, I think, the, the Korean cultural, uh, a couple of Korean cultural associations to have, um, I think, South Korean storytellers as part of the programming. And it was, was excellent. It was really, really uh, wonderful to see that it was, that they were being showcased. So I think it's, it, it's spreading. We're, we're, we're like a virus. We're like a virus. <laughs> What they said. <laughs> you have to show you virus. <laughs> Anyways, I might be getting a little too unquiet. Go, go ahead, is that? <laughs> um, so over here, the son of our former dictator is president, elected president. So um, 
I'm just going to go with what Lee said and that it offers hope, like storytelling. There's always hope in storytelling. There's always, um, yeah, let's, let's just go with that. <laughs> um, yeah, we, uh, we are coming into sort of the early, early stages of election season here as well. Um, but yeah, the, I, I think the stories that we are drawn to always tell us something important about how to carry whatever burdens we have to carry and how to navigate our way through the world. And, um, and that that's how we do it, whether we, whether we are, are making those narratives or sharing them or reading them and finding hope and encouragement in, in the words of others. I think that that's, um, that's where, that's where the magic is. And that's, that's where the hope is. That's awesome. Awesome. I want to thank all of you for being on here. I really feel like we're going to see some great things from Unquiet Spirits next year. Before we close out, though, I want to hear from each of you. What are you doing now? Like, what are your personal projects? What have you got coming up that we can look forward to? I'm just going to go around. I'll start with you, Kayomi, and then we'll just go Jean and Lee and the vet and and, and then everybody watching, go to the links in the description and make sure you get all of the things. Follow all of these women because we're unquiet. We'll come for you, maybe. Like, you don't want to be there. You don't want to be that person that doesn't listen to this. Um, well, right now I have a few things out for submission that I'm hopeful to announce in the coming months. Um, I'm hard at work on a couple longer projects and, um, and I've been very busy, um, building my, my copywriting and, uh, resume writing business. Um, my fiction can be found at workofheartkag.wordpress.com and, uh, subscribers to my newsletter will get, um, a short ebook collection of, uh, 12 original short stories that I wrote. So. Nice. nice. Uh, I'm, Lee's going to give me a glare. I'm still <laughs> working on my, my uh, Qing era Chinese pirate historical horror novel, but um, I've d discovered uh, th these wonderful historical narratives that are, are kind of run um in parallel and it's all about sovereignty it's all about deciding who gets to to have power over you and uh, whether or not you accept that or if you you cast it off so yes yeah, so that that's what I'm working on <laughs> and I um, have a story recently accepted to um, Qualian I'm one of those um, people that read things, and then I think, how do I pronounce it? Qualian News? Is that? News. Qualian News, yeah. I would think that, yeah. Volume 2, uh, from written yeah. backwards. And that that's uh, hopefully coming out either at end of October or November, which I'm very, very excited about. It has my story, The Fallen Man, which is based on the Tiananmen uh, Square Massacres. You can find me at uh, genevieflynn.com.au and I'm on Facebook and Twitter, um, but I'm, I'm not very <laughs> prolific with, with Twitter, so mostly Facebook. Awesome. Yeah, and if, if we did say that wrong, it's Michael Bailey is the editor of that, right? He can leave it, leave it in the comments, like how to pronounce that. <laughs> yeah, I, I would have thought it would be new too, but like Probably French, new. but then you say Nous, don't you? We say, oh... They've got, I don't know. So I don't know. I have a poem in there too. So, um, but I need to read Genevieve's story and I haven't done yet. So I must go back to that proofing document and have a wee look. <laughs> now, <laughs> have a sneak peek. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a couple of books out this 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 month. Um, this one here called Dispatches is a little cosmic horror novella set in World War One. Um, and this anthology of um, New Zealand tale, dark tales. Uh, thank you, Genevieve, for your lovely blurb, um, which is on the back of the book. And um, what I'm, uh, I've got Fox Spirit on a Distant Cloud, which is a poetry collection coming next year from the Cuba Press, and um, also the movie Grafted coming next year from the from. Um, um, propaganda production company and um, 
And um, I'm just, my current project is a science fiction story looking at personhood and I, it's just new, like I've, I've only written a few pages. So it's good. it's a long way away. <laughs> awesome. You can find me at leemurray.info. Um, I am supposed to be writing my novel. Supposed to be, because it, it, it was due <laughs> early this year. <laughs> so my publisher's breathing down my neck, which I love them for. So it's going <laughs> to be a horror, uh, sorry, of course it's horror. Um, it's going to be folk horror, um, which is what I usually mm. write in. And uh, watch out for it, hopefully next year. You can find me at ivetan.com and I'm on Facebook, mm. Twitter and Instagram. I notice nobody calls Twitter by their new name. <laughs> <laughs> I refuse. Yeah. I, I think most people do. And it's just really hard to say that in a sentence <laughs> and know what we're all talking about. Yes. <laughs> well, so Angela, you. no, you're going to tell us oh. about a new genie because I'm still waiting oh, for that yeah. too. In Eugenie will actually be released next May for Happy Month. Um, and oh, and I guess it will. This is, I'm going to tell you guys this. Um, there's going to be uh, awards for Space and Time magazine, and it's going to be unveiled at LycaCon, which is going to be October 30th to November 3rd. So, and I'm going to be hitting all of you up. So just be ready. I'm going to be okay. like, do you want to do a panel? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do a workshop? So just your heads up and your warning. You can unfriend me now. Because <laughs> I'm coming after you guys. <laughs> so, but yeah, and you can find me at AngelaYSmith.com or on my Substack, which is AngelaYurigoSmith.com if you want to bother spelling all that. But yeah, may, this may is, I add something? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Uh, did I, sorry, did I cut you off? No, no, I'm okay. done. Um, so I have two books. So Waking the Dead and um, Seeky Horror, they're available uh, on paper back in the Philippines, but since this audience is overseas, they're also available as ebooks. Awesome. They're both awesome. so good. Yeah. So good. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I finished Seeky Horror and I love it. So that's all these links are going to be in the description. I will try to remember to link to all the books that we've mentioned, including those. Um, Lee's Despatches. See, I pronounce it Despatches now because it's the New the Zealand British spelling. spelling. Despatches. <laughs> um, that was actually a show a couple weeks ago. And then next week, it is going to be talking about um, the anthology that you held up. So, yeah. Gosh. So, look forward to that. Yeah. Um, I guess that's it from us. Uh, thank you guys for being here. As always, I love having the Unquiet Sisters here on the show. I'm I'm privileged to be an unquiet spirit and sister and tortured willow and crane. <laughs> so it, it is awesome that we've built this. And I always really want to give a huge shout out to Lee and Jean for being the two early Asian women filling filling that trope, like making sure that we all know that that's a true thing and starting all of this. So thank you guys. So yeah, with that, I guess we will end the show. See you next week. Bye, Thank everybody. You. Bye. 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 Bye.